Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right. I think Linnea knew I was an easy B, and so she was there. This is going to be one lousy class, and I'll tell you why. None of you brought your homework with you. So you left all your folders home, I can see it, but when you get back, there are two sets of courses, two documents that you should look at. If you can put it within the context of what I'm going to say to you in the next 40 minutes, half hour, whatever length of time I talk, then you can start with the emails, ask questions. I, I said, you've heard me say it before, you pay for four and you get the next 40 free. I look around, we get some people, Walters, my age and older, uh, and you, you, pay, you, get, you pay for four, you get the next 60 free, all right? <laughs> that means you're only a mouse click away for whatever conversation or information you want or for a perspective. I try not to give my opinion. You know, when kids ask me, well, how do you feel about this? I say, it's none of your damn business uh, how I feel about anything. All I try to do is lay out facts. And if the facts are controversial, the facts are problematic, that's it. Uh, if I do have an opinion, it's that if I could press a button, I'd have every one of you be a history major. I don't care how you make your living, uh, as long as somewhere along the line you take two, three, four courses in history, and then when you get out of college becomes that thing called commencement and lifelong learning. What you should do for your avocation is read history to try to understand context. You know, what do we got? We got at least one teenager here. He's 13 years old. What's his context? His context is what a 13-year-older knows. Uh, Walter Goldfarb is pushing 85. He's got another context. I'm one year behind them at 84. I've got another context. So each of us all has our own historical memory, and we each have created our own historical narrative, what we want to believe. So you believe what you want to believe. I'm not here to change anybody's mind. But uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective, let me start with our own historical narrative, Robin and my uh, historical narrative, and our own uh, context, the context of how I see. This is our sixth trip to Berlin. The first trip we made was in 1956 on a very narrow autobahn starting at Braunschweig in what was then the, uh, the British uh, occupation zone, the uh, British Besatzungszone, and we drove on a nar very narrow road at 50 kilometers per hour, because that was the speed limit. And if we went over 50, uh, a, Soviet, a Russian car, it was not a Trabant, it was not an East German uh, 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 official, it was a Russian official who would come in front of us. They, had, they could measure that we were going too fast and slow us down, weave back and forth in front of us. It was a pretty tough 120-mile trip that we made until we got into the occupied west zone of Berlin in 1956. So we made it. We got in there, and that was our first trip. That's over 60 years ago. Uh, it was a different Germany. It was a Germany that was still with, filled with Trummen. It was a ruined Wretched Germany, even 10 years after the war, there was still plenty of rubble around. Baden-Württemberg, where we were studying, was okay. It was the French zone. One bomb fell in Tübingen and blew up the Uhland House. So uh, Tübingen escaped the war pretty uh, uh, completely in 1956 when we were there for the year. It was the French zone of occupation. The French were miserable looking soldiers, unfortunately. They issued them one size overcoat, whether you were five foot four or six foot three. So some of the overcoats got up to here, other overcoats dragged along the ground, and on every Thursday they marched them into the Ulan Stadtbad and cleaned them up, and then marched them back to the French caserne. When we arrived in 1956, that was the first year after Germany, West Germany, the Bundesrepublik, was recognized as a Western ally. Up until that time, nobody was actually certain where this thing that was Germany was going to go. The second two times we came back was after 1961. The wall was up. Uh, we went once into the East Zone, saw the misery, saw what was then a, a sense of Unbehagen, but it was a different Unbehagen than the Unbehagen now, a different discontent than there is now. Now there's a different kind of discontent in the East, but, but it was the same sense of unhappiness there. It was a, a, a wall, it was a regime, families had already been separated. The third, the next three times we came back, the wall was gone, and we watched the evolution of East Berlin. 
and you watch it happen. You saw the av evolution of Alexander Platz. You saw the Potsdamer Platz. You saw the whole part of East, East Berlin suddenly beginning to rise up out of whatever it had been in. So it was really quite remarkable to spend, have six different visits in our lifetime to the city because you watch the change. Now it is one of the more remarkable cities of Europe because it is so green and it has so few people and it has so little traffic. It's amazing to go and come from Istanbul or New York City or any major metropolis, London, which is one gigantic gridlock, and you come to Berlin with 300 to 3 million people population in a large, large area, and you see you get a sense of real civilization, and it's kind of interesting. Um, so this is, where, this is the, con the context of where I'm starting from, from living into our ninth decade and having seen the evolution. When World War II ended, I was 11 years old. And I remember the elation I felt as an 11-year-old kid when the bomb was dropped on Japan. I was an 11-year-old kid, and during the course of the war, I had been trained to dehumanize the Japanese. I was prepared for that. Everything we did, the Japanese were monsters. If you were a German and wore a brown uniform, you were okay. If you were a German and you wore a black uniform, you were a bad guy. And that's the movies that we saw as Hollywood helped shape our ideology. It shaped the It was already messaging was going on. Hollywood went to war and they created this. We made a World War II hero out of Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. We made him a myth, a myth already during World War II. Uh, Eric von Stroheim played him in a movie during the war called Five Graves to Cairo. I fell in love with uh, Erwin Rommel as a 10-year-old uh, kid. So we created our own mythologies, what we wanted to believe and what we didn't want to believe. But I doubt very much if we ever would have dropped the bomb on the Germans. We, won, we would drop it, drop it in, uh, uh, in Japan, and that ultimately is what uh, happened. So this context is what, the one I want to ask you to think about. Um, as, you, as we frame where we are, what we're doing. I, I realized just the other day when we were in Berlin that we're 250 miles from the Polish border. That's the same distance it is from New York to Boston. Uh, and so Europe has its own memory, and you have to dig into that memory and understand what that memory is all about within the context. Originally, I had written a paragraph to the title of, of, of the remarks were really was what? Out of the Ashes, Germany, 1945 to 2018. So when did I begin my narrative for, for today's discussion? 1945. I was going to start 1945. Then when I realized that, you know, I'll do that, we don't have time to cover 300 years, 400 years of German history, given what that 400 years is all about. Uh, I'll start with 1945, but then I remember two years ago, Vicky uh, asked me to go to London to talk about Europe 200 years after Waterloo. And I said, what do you need? she asked, what do we need to know to understand Europe 200 years after Waterloo? And I said, you need to have 46 more courses. <laughs> and I wrote those 46 courses down and gave them to the people in London, and then I wanted you to have them. So you've got them in your little blue folders. When you go home, take a look at them. About 15 of them relate to Germany. And that's what I, I wanted to sort of start with. So two years ago in London, uh, I suggested that I examine the 200 years of Br the history after the Battle of Waterloo. I gave me these 46 courses. And I really wanted to say, find a figure out for each of you where you fit into the historical narrative that you got in your own mind. Um, you know, I, I know that several of you have already spoken to me and said that, you weren't, that your families weren't very happy that you were going to come to Germany that you have family at home that still resent Germany deeply from the Second World War. I can understand, I understand people who had their roots in Germany, who thought of themselves as Germans. Uh, you've got to get a historical context and deal with that as best you possibly can. Uh, fitting yourselves into the historical memory. I, I thought we'd start with Bismarck and then you'd be satisfied. But then coming to Berlin again and seeing Potsdam and Frederick the Great and realizing the contribution that Frederick the Great made to German history in creating the, the, the monolith of Prussia and creating Berlin already as a great city. It was Frederick the Great, Frederick II, Friedrich II, who created the great, the great Prussian Empire and made Berlin. He was born in Berlin 
and he died in Berlin of Sanssouci or Potsdam, but he's buried here, right here. And to understand and go back to the pre-1870 piece, that's one of the courses I didn't write down. But if I were adding to that list now, it would be 47 courses. And the first course would be Frederick II. You really have to understand the power of this totally powerful and totally uh, ungovernable monarch. He brooked no intrusion in his life. He was an absolute monarch. And it was he who decided that an obscure German princess from his part of the world would go to Russia and marry the moron uh, kid who was about to become the czar of Russia. And her name was Katerina. She was a German. And she, she gave up her religion. She went to Russia, became Russian Orthodox, managed to get smart enough to push this guy off, wound up getting him killed, and she became... Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great is a German story. To understand that, and what comes out after that, which was also not on my list of 46 courses that the, we sent to England. What else came about because of Catherine the Great and Frederick the Great? A country that had been on the map of Europe forever disappeared for over 100 years. I said you're 250 miles from the Polish border. That we, have a po we have Poland now. Maybe 50 miles in a shorter way, but we'll go directly east, it might be uh, longer. But uh, Poland disappeared through four partitions, and it was given to partly to Germany, partly to Austria, or partly to Prussia, partly to Austria, and partly to Russia. How long was Poland gone from the map of Europe? From 1795 till when? When did Poland come back? Poland's back now, but when did it come? 1918, Treaty of Versailles. Poland returns, then Poland has a brief 20 years. The, the Poles tell a joke. They say, what happens if you're invaded again by Germany and Russia? The Poles say, first we beat the Germans, then we beat the Russians, because it's always business before pleasure with us. <laughs> that's Polish humor, because that's never what happens. Poland gets screwed. Why? Geography. It's strictly geography. Just like the United States is so lucky. Why are we lucky? Why are we a geographically blessed nation? We got two gigantic oceans. And there's something else. Robert Kaplan's new book on American geography. He says the rivers do not run like the European rivers, which run how? North to south. The American river system runs from north to East to southwest. And once the Erie Canal was built, you could go from the Hudson River to the Pacific Ocean. That is a lucky thing. So when Lewis and Clark did their discovery, they went from the Mississippi to the Missouri, and they got to the Columbia, got to the Pacific. And what was born then? What did Lewis and Clark be born? What is part of the American narrative that we love to believe in? We love it. From sea to shining sea. And what is one of those other lines? God shed his light on thee, on us. That's manifest destiny. That we were a country blessed uniquely by geography and God. That we were a God-blessed country. And that's the American narrative. That's what we like to believe. We are the only nation in the world Christian, a uh, uh, developed nation in the world besides maybe South Korea, that is a nation of faith. And we are a Christian nation. Not quite half the American people still believe in Satan. And not quite half the American people believe, except completely, the creation story. That's who we are. That is a nation of who we are. You can argue about it, but the facts are all the facts. 40, 50, maybe as many as 60 million evangelical Christians in America waiting for the Messiah to return to end the time that we have to begin God's time. That's why e the environmental movement can or cannot get the attention of the evangelical community because if God comes tomorrow, you stop worrying about trees. <laughs> that's simply it. You know, that, that's over with. But going back to the German narrative, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about, uh, it's uh, the, next, the next phase to look at is Bismarck. 
and the, 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 the strength and the power of Bismarck. On that list, I had a course at Bismarck, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit further, but Bismarck was the great architect of the modern Germany. Uh, he was finally pushed aside by, uh, uh, by uh, Wilhelm II, uh, the, 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 the last of the Hohenzollern kings. Uh, that'll give you a deeper context if you understand the role of Bismarck and his friendship with Disraeli. Uh, then, we don't have time for World War I. These are the things we don't have time for. We don't have time for World War I, which you have to spend 16 weeks studying. Uh, you can Every sentence that I utter is a 16-week semester. <laughs> so that's why you've got to decide at which point you're going to start moving along uh, with these subjects matter. So after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, which is a separate course, you really have to have a course on the Treaty of Versailles to understand what the ramifications and implications. Then comes the first great German democracy. It's called the Weimar Republic, 1919 to 1933. It is also the great moment of Berlin. It's when you can call it Weimar, you can call it Paris, but it's Berlin also where you get the great movement, Babelsberg, Ufa, the great motion, motion pictures, the Sturmfilme, the talking films of uh, Peter Lorre, M. Josef von Sternberg, Marlene Dietrich. Some of you in the German expressions, of course, remember Caligari, Nosferatu, uh, Metropolis, uh, and then the Blaue Engel, M. And finally, the first great Nazi film made by a genius director. Her name was Leni Riefenstahl, but the greatest, probably, well, arguably the greatest propaganda movie ever made, the glorification of the 1935 Party Congress in Nuremberg, movie called Triumph des Willens. Triumph des Willens. If you haven't seen it, see it. If you haven't seen Metropolis, see it. If you haven't seen Nosferatu or Caligari or and M or the Blauer Angle, these are great movies. If you, if you haven't seen these movies, you have not understood the evolution of film as an art form. And it is an art form, it's also a huge historical document. So uh, getting to understand that, we have, certainly don't have time for the rise of Nazism and the fact of Adolf Hitler. Uh, you, you, you know, these are things you gotta know, you should know it all. And being in Europe, and within the context of a Germany that you have to study, that's great. It's described for the first time in Goethe's Faust. The statue of Schiller is out here. I haven't seen a local statue of Goethe yet, but I'm sure he's here. The two giants of the original Weimar, the Weimar of the 18th century, Schiller and Goethe. But it was Goethe who, in his story of Faust, talked about the character of Faust and what tore Faust apart. The devil, but not only did he have the devil in him, what else did he have in him? He had God. So how did, how, did, how did Goethe describe it? You only need to know one line of Goethe. One line of Goethe, and then you're forgiven. It's a shame, but you're forgiven. <laughs> Faust hat zwei Seelen in einer Brust. Translation, two souls in one heart, in one breast. Two souls in one breast. And that was it. That, that, that tearing in human nature, that really, that sense of the two, two, the two prongs that are in each of us. Uh, the two souls in not only the German breast, but the two souls in the European breast. And the two souls in the American breast. Because whether you like it or not, Donald Trump is as American as apple pie. He is part of us. We are all part of this, and there's no escaping that. That is the, the one soul is the European Union and unity, and there is this powerful instinct for separation in Europe, as in Catalonia, the Basque region, Scotland, Flanders, Corsica, and now even in Lombardy in Italy. There are 276 separate and distinct European regions, each one with a separatist movement. That makes the 50 United American states look like a homogeneous nation by comparison. And the separatist American movements in Texas and California look like children playing in a daycare center by comparison to the depths of European separation. The Europeans have a tradition of wanting to break away and be by themselves in each individual region. Looks like Catalonia may be the next, the Basques may be a little bit under control, and then we'll always have the, the poster child for separation, the Balkans. And by the Balkans, I mean what? 
What do you need to know? What do you need to know to be educated fully or somewhat? Just the people who are, constitute the Balkans. They call Tito the first Yugoslavian and the last Yugoslavian. When you get rid of Yugoslavia, what are you left with? Croatia? Croatia? Now in the European Union, now in the European Union, Roman Catholic. Serbia applying to the European Union. Church? What kind of Orthodox? Serbian Orthodox. Bosnia? About 50% Muslim now. The other two are Croatian and uh, Serbian. But about 50% Muslim. Language? One language. Serbo-Croatian. All of them speak Serbo-Croatian. Differences? Serbians write it with Cyrillic alphabet. Croatians write it with Latin alphabet. DNA? The DNA of the people? 99.9 .9 the same. They are the same people, speaking the same language, and they have learned to hate each other. That's what made Freud so smart. He called something, he created something called uh, uh, the narcissism of minor difference. Uh, der Narzissismus, der, der kleineren Unterschied in German. The, minor, the little difference. It doesn't take people a lot to get to hate each other. The little bit of difference is enough to make you hate each other. The pilgrims who came to the United States in 1620 looking for religious freedom, dissident Protestants, by 1660 they were hanging Quakers on the Boston Common. Nothing really changes. Nobody ever was welcomed into the United States. That's another mythology that we have, that we welcome people to America. Anyhow, our topic is unified Germany. I haven't even gotten to it yet. Um, <laughs> But that's enough for us. In less than a half hour, we have to start at the end. Where do we start? The Germans call 1945 Anno Zero, Anno, Year Zero. So you can, be, you can buy into that and start in 1945. What was Berlin like in 1945? Totally. Totally destroyed. Uh, the American journalist Theodore White described the Berlin of 1945, quote, as the most thoroughly destroyed place that I have ever seen except for Hiroshima. Berlin was worse than Tokyo, and there was not one building left standing in Tokyo. It had been burned down to the ground. Berlin, he said, was worse than Tokyo. Here it was just nothing but rubble. To under understand that, I mean, and so uh, what were the films like in 1946 and 47? That'll be one of the courses that's on the second sheet. They were called what? What was the name given to the kind of films that the Germans made in 46 and 47? Trümmerfilme. What does Trümmer mean? Rubble. They were rubble films. They showed pictures of Berlin, I mean, this gorgeous city now, in ruins. What, what was Europe like in 45, 46, and 47? I mean, what, what did you have? You had 50 million dead Europeans just in Europe. 50 million dead Europeans. 6 million dead Germans. 14 million dead Russians. 6 million de 3 million dead Poles. They were, they, I mean, it was a slaughterhouse, Europe. And they were all dead and all starving, what was left. And the country was divided and simply the way it was going to be. I'll turn to the list for a second just to get us thinking about of what it was like. But in 45, 46, this country was completely destroyed as Europe was. The, the nature of the country, the nature of the way the, the, the world was going to, uh, going to evolve, it was going to evolve with a, a, a different kind of Germany. Because uh, the, the other list that you got, the one that's called Berlin Out of the Ashes, 1945 to, 19, to 2018, the first, I, I put it in terms of the context, uh, um, Henry, it starts with a quotation from Henry Kissinger. He says, you must never forget that the unification of Germany is more important than the development of the European Union that the fall of the Soviet Union is more important than the unification of Germany, and that the rise of India and China is more important than the fall of the Soviet Union. Henry Kissinger, born in 1923, he's 94 years old, but he's seen it all. And so he has a context. The context in 1945 
when the war was over, was presented by the American Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, who proposed the Morgenthau Plan. That is the first course that I suggested in the little handout that you got that's called Berlin Out of the Ashes, 1945 to 2018. So that's where you have to start, really, to get yourselves understanding how far Germany has come in 73 years. They've made this enormous move forward. But first, in 1945, there was the Morgenthau Plan. Anybody want to comment on what the Morgenthau Plan was? Secretary of the Treasury presented it to FDR when he was still alive in 1944. He said, basically he said what? Enough of Germany. Let's just empty it out, take away everything manufacturing. Russians said, hooray. The Russians went in and started moving every factory out of the east toward the country had been divided already in four. There was the Russian zone of occupation, the British zone of occupation, the American zone of occupation, and the French zone of occupation. So Germany was ripe for anything that anybody wanted to do to it. And Morgan saw, said, let's reduce it to two small agricultural countries that will never once again threaten Europe. That, that the 50 million dead this time, that's enough. Let's, let's just go for it and see how fast we can do it. Japan had a, a friend. Who was Japan's friend that wanted to make sure that the Japanese survived the occupation, survived American hatred of the Japanese, and could rebuild themselves? General MacArthur. MacArthur said, you got to keep this guy on the throne. Keep the, keep the Mikado, keep the emperor on the throne. So Japanese had stability. Germany had no stability. And Morgenthau threatened the end of Germany. He wanted the dismemberment, permanent partition of the German state. Uh, but something interfered. Yeah, it was the Morgenthau plan. He was the Secretary of the Treasury. He stopped all of that. He split them up, broke up the conglomerates, broke up the big name companies. In the meantime, all the Russians cared about was getting every machine out of East Germany and getting it to the Soviet Union. They felt they were entitled. 14 million dead Russians, that was a lot of dead people, and they were going to strip Germany bare. They didn't care what happened to Germany. But Morgenthau had a plan, and that was for the total pastoralization of Germany. Two little pastoral countries, one in the north, one in the south. Just little places where you could play Beethoven sixth and chirp along with the birds. That's all they cared about. But something else. Then came another act that only reinforced America's attitude, and those were the first Nuremberg trials of 46, 45 and 46. The Nuremberg trials, in, they, why were they held in Nuremberg? They weren't, why weren't they held in Berlin? Because Nuremberg was the site of Hitler's great, uh, uh, Riefenstahl's great movie, and the great site of his, uh, of his uh, enormous uh, political campaigns. So the, the trial was held in 1945 to, uh, to 1946, an international military tribunal, uh, the four powerful countries, USA, GB, USSR, and France, and the 24 leaders of the Third Reich. Goebbels had already committed suicide. Hitler had committed suicide. Goering had not yet, but during the trial, Goering committed suicide. And then, one by one, they were, they were tried, and overwhelmingly, they were convicted and executed. And most of those 24 German leaders of the Third Reich were executed. A few were not. Albert Speer was the only one, the Minister of Architecture, who said guilty. He declared himself guilty, and they gave him, he did 20 years. Um, um, Dönitz, who was the, leading, the leader of the Third Reich after Hitler committed suicide, was given a life, uh, a life um, term in prison, but eventually was left out. For those of you that remember a wonderful Stanley Kramer movie, I'm not a political scientist. I'm a humanist, so I go to the movies. And I see a lot of movies, and I believe movies, in many ways, are the arts, the eyes, and the soul, of the mouth of, of what people are trying to tell you. Judgment at Nuremberg, a 1961 movie starring Spencer Tracy as an American tribunal judge. Maximilian Schell plays the German a defense attorney, and it's uh, a dozen German judges are being tried for sending innocent people to their death. Burt Lancaster plays. It was a great cast, terrific movie. Marlene Dietrich was in it. Um, Judy Garland played a victim of, uh, of Nazism in the detention camp. Uh, Montgomery Clift 
played another one, a homosexual. So because in Germany, between 33 and 35, before Jews, before Gypsies, before Poles, the Germans systematically killed 150,000 of their own people who were mentally retarded, Down syndrome, epileptic. They went into the, into the asylums where people were and simply gave them injections of oxygen and killed them for the purification of the race. The United States was only a little bit better. We castrated, and, uh, we castrated people and we sterilized them, but we didn't kill them. We castrated, by law, we castrated and sterilized over 70,000 people in the 1930s. But we did it by law. Oh, also, they did it by law. Uh, and, um, but we didn't, we didn't take the, the, the next uh, step. Um, but these judges were now going to be brought on trial. And in the movie, terrific movie if you haven't seen it yet, um, uh, Maximilian Schell at the end says to Spencer Tracy, I bet you within five years, every one of these people is out of jail because you can't afford to have them in jail. What did he mean? What had started in 46, 47 right away? The Cold War. The Cold War had started, the two hegemons, the United States, the Soviet Union, pitted each other, and where were they pitted against each other? In Berlin and in Germany. So uh, uh, instead of saying two rural communities, we're going to rearm both sides, or at least reaffirm both sides. And that's the second course, the third course, that you really have to understand, the Cold War course. You go home and look at the list that I gave you for the 10 courses you need for, to understand Germany since 1945, and you'll see them. Then I would suggest that you go to YouTube or wherever else you go to if you're in Germany and look up Trümmerfilme. Look up films of debris films of, Rune, of wreckage to see what Berlin looked like in 1945 and 1946. It's a good memory to remind Europeans what horrors had been done on these cities in Germany and Europe everywhere. Europe was in ruins. As I said, 50 million people, you know, the Holocaust deniers have a hard problem in a way because forget, it's easy, I'm Jewish, I can say it, forget the Jews, forget the six million. How do you justify the fact that 44 million other people also died? They all died. It, it, it didn't happen that nobody died. 50 million people died. So de denying any one piece of it, denying the gypsies, denying the Serbians, denying the Poles, uh, you can't do it because one, each one reflects on the other one. But I would recommend three films that are Trümmerfilme, all in English, rubble films that show the complete devastation of Berlin. The first one is actually a German movie. It's called Der Mörder unter uns. The, murderer, the murderers are among us. 1946. This was, and the second one was called Anno Zero Zero. That was done by Roberto uh, Rossellini, a terrific movie. And the third is an American movie made by an expat, Fred Zinnemann, who came over to America from Germany, uh, called The Search with Montgomery Clift. All peop, uh, films on Berlin, of the destruction of Berlin, the devastation, lost children, children desperate to find their parents. Nobody could find anybody. So it was totally chaos. In, in Europe and Germany in 1946. But already out of the ashes came the German film industry, which had its great center here in Berlin, in Babelsberg, Ufa, the great uh, film industry that Germany had created in the 1920s, even up to 33, even after Hitler came to power. The Nazi film industry really poured out a lot of films, interesting ones, and it's a documentary stuff that's worthwhile seeing. The fourth course on the list that you don't have in front of you is called Germany and Berlin, the Cold War, 1945 to 1990. So, so far I said the Morgenthau Plan, the first Nuremberg Trials, and then three films that you should see. And then fourth, Germany and Berlin, the Cold War, 45 to 90, when the wall came down. You really have to understand all the dynamic of that. The four power occupation of Germany from 46 to 55, the division of Berlin, into four, four sections, or two, actually, because the three were finally combined. And the, the, the Soviet effort to close it down. In 1948, the Germans made, they made an effort to blockade Berlin. They closed the little road that I went on. What was produced by it? One of the great, remarkable, technological feats of the, 
the, it was called the airlift. airlift. The airlift. About 5,000 C-47s flew food in, 20, 20 tons a day, into West Berlin to feed the population. The, what could the Russians have done? There was one other thing they could have done, start World War III by shooting them down. They didn't. They buzzed them, but nobody ever pulled the trigger on one of those. That's, I mean, you talk about being close to a war, it could have happened at any second, and it didn't. So after a year, the Russians realized it's not working, and they stopped the blockade and got you back onto the little road. But to understand that, you need to understand the, the airlift of 48 to 49, and then the decision on the Americans, on the American part, that no, we're not going to let this country collapse, and we're not going to let Europe collapse. We can't afford it. We need a powerful Europe. So what, uh, we need a powerful Western Europe, because the Soviets had already put the Iron Curtain up. So what did, what did the Democrat, what did, uh, uh, it was Truman and his Secretary of State. The Marshall Plan, $20 billion poured into Western Europe to rebuild all of Europe. I was a beneficiary of it, because the American senator from Arkansas named William Fulbright said, what are they going to do with all this war material we've left over in Europe? Let's give it to the Europeans, take back their useless currency, and dump it on some of our stupid American students. <laughs> and we got $1,000 in 1956, 4,200 marks, because the mark was 4.2 marks to the dollar. And we got $1,000 in free transportation on a boat the SS Berlin, Haka Hapagloid, to come to Germany and study at Tübingen for a year. And that was the Fulbright program. He bought all of the Zloty, he bought Lira, he bought Marx, he bought Franks, and gave it to American students, and the Fulbright program was an enormous success. So understanding what we, de we decided we were going to do, uh, the building of the Marshall Plan, and then the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany. We announced it first in the late 40s, early 50s, that we were going to allow West Germany to have their own elections, create a chancellor, and run a government. The Russians reacted immediately by creating the Deutsche Demokratische Republik. But that was a reaction. We took the first step to create West Germany. They followed along and created East Germany. You have to study all of that. You'll get it. You'll find the right political scientist, R.B. will tell you how to do all of this. Uh, NATO was created when? Not immediately. 1955. NATO comes along, and you have to see to what extent. Then comes the Eastern Bloc, because the Russians mostly reacted. They didn't know how, what to do. We created, and the Russians reacted. When was Germany finally allowed into the United Nations? I mean, it was still a, a little bit of an outlaw country. 73. In 1973, they let the Germans, West Germany and East Germany, simultaneously into the United Nations. The wall came up in 61, and the wall came down in 89. So now there is, uh, there is one full generation in Berlin that has lived without the wall, and one generation that lived with the wall. But there's one entire generation that never saw the wall. So it's now part of the official history and evolution of the country. Um, so understanding that, then it, the unification of Germany, how did it happen? That's a you'll, you'll spend a whole semester figuring out how that happened. Because how, how did it happen? What was required? What, would, what, what did you need to have? What, how, under what circumstances would it never have happened? If the Soviet Union, I mean, what kept the two Germanys apart? The United States and Russia. Nobody really wanted a unified Germany. The French prime minister said, I love Germany so much, I want two of them. <laughs> they didn't want a unified Germany. And as much as you read Condoleezza Rice's book that said that once this happened, George, w. Bush, or George Bush and I decided that we were going to unify it, forget it. Who unified the Germany, the Germanys? Helmut Kohl, the, the German Bundeskanzler, he did it. The minute that the wall came down, he saw the opportunity, and the Germans who had, I think I said in, in the German Expressionism class, you will never keep this country apart. I said, this country is destined to come together. As much as they may hate each other, 
they're going to come together at some point. And the minute the wall came down, the movement for unification began, and it happened very quickly. Americans had no idea what was going on. The British were still be terrified, and the French didn't know what to do. But the Germans, they made it happen all by themselves, a subject for an entire semester. OK. Um, that's a course. Another, the, the fifth course I put down was the German economic miracle from 1945. How this country came out of the ashes. The, the, uh, the Marshall Plan was great, but the Germans had to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and they did. They focused on economic recovery. It was called in German, the Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle. It was done by a minister of economics. Under the first Bundeskanzler was Konrad Adenauer. He, Ludwig Erhard was the second. And they made have two brilliant German economists. One was a charismatic leader, der Alter. And so finding out who the leaders are, Angela Merkel is number which? She's number nine. There were eight before her, and each one had a contribution. The first one, who was a man of the left, was Willy Brandt. Willy Brandt, and Brandt had to do something, because the map of Europe after World War II had shifted four inches to the left. Or is it to the right? To the right. A big piece of Germany was given to Russia, took a big piece of Poland. Poland took a big piece of Germany, and Germany was left truncated. What, uh, and the, 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 East German, or the Germans of the East said, we will never, ever give up our part of the country. Willy Brandt became Bundeskanzler and went to the East, went to the Poles, and said, it's yours forever. We don't want it back. It's yours. The war is now officially over. And the Germans, the German expats is what they were, sucked it in. And that movement, I think, is pretty much gone now, the idea that we got to take it back from Poland. I don't think that's a threat for the future anymore. But that was what Brandt did himself, and he was an enormous statesman, the capacity to do that. So making the, the, the then you had the labor shortages, talking about a repeating of history. In the 1950s, the Germans had shortages of labor. What did they do? They had to bring in Turks. Greeks, Yugoslavs, Italians, Spanish, they gave them a wonderful euphemistic name. Gastarbeiter, guest workers. It was very nice of them. But in the meantime, the Grundgesetz said what? The basic constitution said what? By the way, don't ever expect to become a citizen. You are not a native German. You don't have German mother and father. If you don't have German mother and father, you cannot. That was the Grundgesetz. It's changed in 2002, I believe. But the basic constitution said, no, you must have a German. That tradition came out, alas, out of the Nazi period when everybody had to have what was called an Ahnenpass. An Ahnenpass, how would you translate it? You're a hereditary passport. On an Ahnenpass, you had your two generations of grandparents back to prove that they were both all four of them were Aryans. If you had one grandparent who was by maybe Jewish, you were considered a Mischling. So the, the, the laws of Nazi Germany were very rigorous about that, and a little bit of that lingered on, but that war, that eventually has changed also. So the economic miracle, how Germany came a whole semester. But getting into now the arts and culture, and a long, long German word, Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Vergangenheitsbewältigung, conquering your past. How do you conquer your past? No other country in the world had to deal with Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany. The Germans had to deal with it, and they had to deal with it face on. And they did. And they produced a generation of writers who said, we can help. Probably the most famous of all of them won the Nobel Prize in, I believe, 1970. His name was Gunter Grass. And Gunter Grass wrote what was called the Danzig Trilogy, three works. One of them, a huge novel, which I believe some of you read in my class, in the German Expressionism class, The Tin Drum, Blechtrommel. Good movie also, made by Volker Schondorf. Uh, then he wrote, um, besides that, Hundejahre, and um, what was the third one? Uh, the Tin Drum, Cats and Mouse. Right, Cats and Mouse, three works dealing with how the Germans can conquer their past, deal with it, look it in the eye, and move forward. And a whole generation of post-World War II German writers 
We're asking the tough questions. Wo warst du, Vater? Where were you, Daddy, during World War II? What did you do during World War II? Some fathers lied, some fathers told the truth, but the kids had to know, and it became one of the great moments of German history as they faced up to the fact for the 500th anniversary of the University of Tübingen in 1977, the university went into their archives and dug out every portrait of a faculty member wearing a Hockenkreuz, wearing a swastika. Because it turns out that Tübingen was the, one of the brownest of the brown universities. It was very Nazi. And they had not covered any of it up. They were determined by their 500th anniversary it was all going to come out. And they did. And that is Vergangenheitsbewältigung. They got, they looked at their past it's square in the eye, conquered it, and then have moved on ever since. But Günter Grass and conquering the past, the German intellectuals led the charge to having the German people face up with it. By 1960, in the 1960s, you could feel comfortable being a revolutionary again. It started in the United States and came to, America, came to Germany. Uh, so much does, besides jeans and variety of different clothing. What started, there are some people here from the class of 68. Anybody here from graduating in 1968? Somebody from 68? I can't see all the way over there. Joe McCarthy, you came into Tufts wearing beanies. The women didn't have Coke machines in their dorms because it was bad for their teeth. You went from that environment when you graduated in 1968, you were anarchists. Something happened in America between 1964 and 1968 that created the student movement. Steve Wormiel graduated in 1972. That was the last of the anarchist generation because President Bush, no, it wasn't, it was President Nixon was smart enough to do what? He said, the only way I'm going to get these kids off my back is to end the draft. And in 1973, the Americans ended the draft, and we haven't had many student protests since. Because once they were no longer exposed to having to go into the military, they really didn't give a damn. Only the draft threatened them. There were 500,000 soldiers on the ground in Vietnam, and many of them were draftees, and they didn't like that one bit. Uh, so that changed everything. But the movement that, went, that caused the student riots in Europe in, the, in late in 1968, started in America, came over here, and European, uh, the, the German universities simply exploded. They produced also an iconic filmmaker. His name was Rainer Werner Fassbinder. If you haven't seen any of Fassbinder's movies, he represents all the counterculture, the David Bowie, the anti-culture, the, the man who fell from Earth, whatever you want to talk about, the students of the 60s and 70s, Rainer Werner uh, Fassbinder, his movies really determined it. Uh, he wrote a great, he made a great film series on one of the local plazas here called Berlin Alexander Platz, and it's coming to the United States this year. A uh, 12 part series is going to be paced with English subtitles, uh, so it'll be kind of interesting. But Fassbinder's movies are the iconic movies of revolt in Germany, and they represent at least a one semester or maybe a whole, understand the violence. And it got violent here. You had the Bader Meinhof Gruppe, you had violent kids on the street, you had bombings, you had assassinations. Germ Europe was big an anarchy. The French, the Germans, and the Italians, they all tried to suppress it as best they could. They got through it, they calmed things down. But that's a course. Um, Hollywood in Germany, uh, they, you know, it's so wonderful to be able to just look at a bunch of movies and understand. What, what's the first iconic movie of my generation, of your generation, that we all say the greatest movie ever made? Casablanca. Well, it's a movie that has Germans in it. Ten minutes. A movie that has Germans in it. So Casablanca, uh, 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 the guy who plays Major Strasse, Konrad Veit, was the original Cesare in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. So there's context there also. And uh, uh, it was, it's good. here's uh, uh, Rick's, Rick is in Casablanca. It's November 1941. The dates of Casablanca, November 1941. It starts with the globe. Why? Because most Americans couldn't find North Africa on a map. <laughs> that, oh, he had no geographic literacy. And starts with the globe and then shows how uh, 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 refugees traveled across North Africa, got to Casablanca, and then got stuck. Rick is an expat sitting there, doesn't give a damn about anything, loses everything. At the end, 
when it was his friend, the black pianist, says, what's the date? The guy says, November 1941. By the time the last plane is going to Lisbon, is no longer November 41, it's December 41, and the United States is now at war with Germany. Because the Germans declared war after Pearl Harbor. We didn't declare war on Germans. They declare war on us. And so Rick Blaine gets involved, Casablanca becomes a, war, a movie of World War II. The Diary of Anne Frank, 1959. Stalag 17, Robert, uh, uh, William Holden's movie about a nasty German concentration camp. Judgment at Nuremberg, 61. Then comes the movies that are sort of looking at German history again. Um, the Train about uh, stealing German art, um, uh, French art, 1964. Marathon Man with Laurence Olivier, 1976. The Boys from Brazil, the twin uh, research done by Mengele. Raiders of the Lost Art, Hitler's obsession with Old Testament uh, documents. Schindler's List in 1993. And Monuments Men just two years ago. So movies and Germany and the United States, really a topic that we can look for. The last course I suggested was just examine the eight, the eight, eight uh, uh, chancellors from Adenauer to Merkel and ask yourself where Germany is going now. Finally, Germany 2018. Where is Europe and Germany going? It's pulling its, in all directions. We have no idea. The French, the Germans, the Italians, Europe is in trouble. What country economically is not? Germany is now the fourth greatest gross national product in the world. So the Germans out of the ashes is one of the truly great economic stories. There is still plenty of unbehagen, of uncertainty, unhappiness between the eastern part and the western part. But ec the Economist just read an wrote an article on how cool it is to be a German. So being a German is cool again. Uh, that's nice, because the Germans may or may not find themselves cool. But the rest of the world is looking at Germany and said, cool. You are now in Berlin. Look out the window and imagine what this country looked like 73 years ago, and then say to yourself, this has been a miracle. OK, thank you very much. OK, we got time for questions. Jerry, we got question time. Five minutes, OK. Anybody have a question? I can't see too well there. So come to the openings if you have one. Anybody have a question they want to ask? Yeah, please, P Lloyd. The, the ability of Europe to stay as an entity. Will, will, the, will you ask it, will the European Union prevail? You know, as I said, there are 256 separate parts that are pulling in one direction. It'll take rational leadership to get them to come to stay together, uh, the, who the next generation of leaders will be who will make the European Union work. There's a tension coming up. Croatia is in. Which of the next two countries trying to get in? Serbia, Serbia and Bosnia. Serbians, Bosnia Herzegovina is trying to get in now. We'll see what kind of tension that's going to produce. Can the three of them live together? The Balkans are always going to be a tinderbox. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that <laughs> President Erzal about 40 years ago asked, when will uh, Turkey get into the European Union? And Erzal said, when the Holy Roman Empire ends. <laughs> and he said, and then Mitterrand said, or was it Giscard d'Estaing, said, we will never allow a Muslim country into the European Union. It may never. You know, Islam got to the gates of Vienna in 1600, and that scared the hell out of the Europeans. They were killing each other. The reason that Islam got to the gates of Vienna, because the Protestants and the Catholics were butchering each other in the Thirty Years' War. Then they took a look and said, we hate each other, but we hate them more. So let's get together for a little while. And then they did. But they institutionalized that. The northern part of Europe is Protestant. The southern part is Catholic. Germany? Right down the middle. So I think it still says in the Good Gazettes, if the prime minister is a Catholic, the president is a Protestant. That was in the original Grundgesetz. Whether that's been changed or not, I'm not sure. So it's going to be a, a tug of war, and we'll see. You gotta, you know, it's a question of how you feel about the human species. You know, peace on earth, goodwill toward man. We've never had it. It would be the end of civilization as we know it. We have to figure out, can we learn to get along? How long is human history? 6,000 years, and all we've had is war. So we got to figure out if we can get to some environment where we're not killing each other.
Anything else? Yeah. yeah. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, it's only a children's game. But it is. It is reflective of America. It was an all-white game. I mean, it reflected America. America is a country that was built for white Protestant males. That's why the country was founded, by white Protestant males. Everybody else that got a piece of it got it by reluctant giving and taking back and forth. <coughs> Baseball was a white man's game. If you had any a drop of black color in you, you were not allowed to play the game until a evangelical Methodist named Branch Rickey said, I'm going to integrate the game in 1947 and brought Jackie Robinson up. Uh, and, you know, these two guys prayed together on their knees, both men of faith, and Robinson became the first black ball player. There were other people that didn't want him around. The vote was 14, 15 to 1 of the owners to keep him out. But he came, played, and the game got integrated. So... We simply have to go against the better angels of our, or the worse angels of our nature. In 1967, <laughs> 67, there were still 14 states in the United States that had laws on the book that said white people cannot marry people of color. We were still an anti-miscegenation country in 1967. So we, we have taken three big steps forward and maybe one step back. We may be in the middle of the one step back now, depending on your political persuasion. Excuse me? All right. President, President Trump has said NATO's got to spend more money on arms. So they're going to spend more money on arms. Chances are the arms are going to be American because we outsell the next 10 countries. I mean, we are the greatest arms salesmen in the history of the world. So they're going, to, they're going to pick up. They'll spend more money. They'll militarize more, and that'll be it. You know, I mean, how, uh, the countries that are, they, they, they got rid of a bunch of their nuclear weapons during the period of the Cold War, at least Gorbachev and Bush agreed on the destruction of some nuclear weapons. Now we're going to upgrade our entire collection, $20 billion worth. We're going to upgrade all of that. So it's going to be, you know, you'll have to determine over the course of your lifetimes whether we are God's children or a naked ape. I have no idea. All I know is our capacity for violence is very distinct. And so we'll have to figure out, at my age, I become just atavistic. I surround myself with my family and hope that the specimen, human species, gives me enough time to get my children and my grandchildren up there. But it's a, it's a dangerous world. We never had the technology that we have now so we could blow the world apart. Uh, and arming NATO, it's, it's intuitive. We have to arm ourselves because we've got enemies. Well, we create enemies. We need enemies. We've got to have them. It's either Iran or China or uh, whatever country. Russia, which has a gross national product the size of Italy, uh, there's our great challenge and our enemy. They're fixing our elections. Who knows? All I know is we fix the Guatemalan elections, the Chilean elections, and the Iranian elections 60 years ago. So we all do the same things, but we have our own narrative. We believe what we want to believe. You should all believe what you like to believe. Uh, so NATO is NATO. It's going to be armed to the teeth. Okay, no exams. You're all done. <laughs>